Welcome to the Mount Pleasant Magazine podcast, featuring discussions and interviews about the people, places, and events that make Mount Pleasant such a special place. Hi, this is Roger Gaither, your host for the Mount Pleasant Magazine podcast. Today, Bill Mascio, publisher of Mount Pleasant Magazine, chats with Kathy Landing, candidate for mayor of the town of Mount Pleasant. Now, here are Bill and Kathy. We're so excited today we have Kathy Landing to the Mount Pleasant Magazine podcast. Ka- uh, Kathy, thanks for joining us. Uh, um, it's, it's really a pleasure to have you here. And I'd like to, our audience to get to know you. Is that cool? Oh, absolutely, Bill. And thank you so much for having me. Well, uh, I've, I've been wanting to do this for a while, actually. So how long ago did you and your husband, Joe, move here? Initially, we moved here in 1984 with the U.S. Navy. And so Joe was na- stationed here right after we were married, um, got married at Duke University, where we went to school and met and came here. And then we moved back. We moved away for job reasons after the Navy. But then we moved back 17 years ago and bought our current home in Mount Pleasant. So you've lived in Mount Pleasant a good while. Mm-hmm. Do you and Joe have some children and, and, uh, and where'd they go to school and what's going on with them? So we have a daughter, Christy, and a son, Joseph. They are both full grown and out of the house. So we're officially empty nesters and have been for quite a while, which is part of the reason why I was able to run for council four years ago. And um, they both went to, well, they went to Pinckney, Cario, and Wando. And I say they both, they both went to Cario and Wando. Um, Joseph went to Pinckney. Um, and so then they went, uh, Christy went on to Duke University and Joseph went to University of Miami. And uh, so they both, uh, in fact, Joseph's back here now working uh, in the community in media management. That's great. So Duke, uh, so what did she study at Duke? She studied international relations with a minor in uh, art history and dance, two minors, and uh, tried dancing for a year in New York, uh, got with a small company and said, mom, you have to eat. I think I'll get a regular job. (laughs) But then she ended up pursuing the art world. So she's over in London right now getting her second master's degree. Second master's degree. That's awesome. You know, I got to ask this because this is going to be about you running. Okay. What, what is the burning desire for you to want to take this on? And most people, when you're empty nesters, they spend time doing other things besides running for mayor. So tell me, tell me what's burning inside of you to want to do this. Well, I think of it as my community service. I started in community service as early as really junior high school. I was very involved in everything from student council to where we, you know, Christmas caroled at at, uh, nursing homes and all the way through, even in high school, my high school job was being a church organist for the 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg. Um, And, uh, and then on onward into my adult life, where I was always very involved in both civic organizations, my church and various other nonprofits. Um, In fact, the one that has been near and dear to my heart the longest is Operation Smile. I've been on the board of Operation Smile for 24 years, including uh, heading up numerous fundraisers and chairing the board for eight years. And so when my children came along, and of course, I built my career here as well. But when my children came along, um, I did, I balanced all these different things. And my husband was always my absolute supporter. He did a lot of things too. Um, but then once they were out of the house and, um, and out of school completely, I felt this sense of, you know, so much more energy and not enough to do. And I realized that if we looked at all the different things I'd done, it, it, it led to the idea that I could probably help a lot more people. And so we decided, my husband and I, that I should run for office and it was a great experience. I loved running four years ago. I loved meeting everybody. And I truly loved serving as well. So, um, but, you know, one person said, not one, several people at my office said to me, because I have a great career. Um, and they said, why in the world would a nice person like you want to get into politics? It's so nasty and ugly. And I said, you know, how is it ever going to change if nice people don't step up and try to make a difference? So well, I, <laughs> I, not to interrupt you, Kay, but you got to say that, you know, I've done articles w- on you in the past, and I remember calling your office one day. You weren't there, but I talked to Joe, and uh, who I've not actually ever met. And uh, he just, I was taken by how much he supported you and how highly he thought of you. I thought that was, uh, and, a not, and, and a lot of men and a lot of husbands, me being one of them, uh, don't always speak as highly as I feel we should for about our wives. So I, th- I thought it was really refreshing. So you guys have a great relationship. He's supporting you all, all along with this. 
Yes, well, the feeling is definitely mutual and, you know, to uh, happily married for 37 years and truly still in love. So, you know, you have to you have to have something going right. <laughs> the things that are important to you in your campaign, uh, I know that you've got some bullet points on on some of your campaign literature. What are those three bullet points and why are they important to you, please? So my first bullet point would be we need a mayor who is both positive and proactive and knows how to collaborate to get things done. The second one is we need a mayor for all of Mount Pleasant, not just a certain part of town, not just a special interest group, but rather everyone, including people who have just moved here as well as natives and everything in between. And then finally, we need a mayor who understands that limited government is the best government because ultimately people rely on their elected officials first and foremost for providing for the common defense. And so we need to make sure our first responders, our police, our fire, and our public service workers, who are all so valuable in protecting us and making sure uh, this community runs well, we need to make sure they're provided for first and foremost. And that's, that's uh, to me, what it means to focus on limited government and not everything else. Be part of the conversation surrounding Mount Pleasant. Sponsor the Mount Pleasant Magazine Podcast. Podcast marketing is the new, powerful way to brand your business and reach your customers. For more information, visit carolinapodcasts.com or call 843-345-7012. You're listening to the Mount Pleasant Magazine Podcast. I remember being at a recent council, but I don't want to get too too granular here uh, because I want to talk about you. And what you stand for, but I remember being at a at a at a city at a at a con council meeting, and there was a lot of talk about the first responders, and there was a lot of. Do you remember that particular meeting that they all yes. t- tell me? Do, does does our does our community support the uh, first responders as well as you think we should? Well, actually, I was very thrilled this past uh, week and a half ago in committee, the HR committee saw the new wage and compensation study, which had been updated. It was supposed to be brought to us last March, and just before it was brought to us, COVID hit. And so in order to make ends meet and try to get through what everybody knew was going to be a very uncertain time, we actually did have to, um, we had to put everything on hold. We had to freeze our wages and have a hiring freeze. And then um, this was back in early 2020. Yes. March of 2020. We were supposed to see the wage and compensation study. Okay. And so what happened is we instead had to freeze all that. And then we were able to, um, sorry, my, yeah. Um, And so then we brought that forth just last week and it did need to be updated for a year because not only was there a year's worth of inflation there, but on top of normally it's a four year process. This ended up being five years. But um, not only did we need to bring it up to date for inflation, we needed to also bring it up for the circumstances that have changed. All the things that folks have had to face dealing with COVID in the community, especially first responders and anybody with with the public constantly, but also things like wage pressure and um, labor shortages. So we really did, they did a thorough job. We brought it, we voted on it. And I'm proud to say that the other night we passed it unanimously, um, substantial raises for uh, the vast majority, if not all of our staff. Did everybody on council get behind that? Yes, absolutely. So, and I do want to add more, one more thing. Um, Please. Our, uh, there's been so much talk across the country about defunding the police and things of that nature. And we've seen such a rise in crime in so many places. Mount Pleasant has been known for so long as a very low crime community. And that's very much because of our first responders and our police. And so um, we are actually going to not defund. We're going to defend and honor them because next week on Saturday night, and this started as my idea in fire committee, but but we're real excited that all of council is, is very much behind this. Um, we are going to have the first annual Mount Pleasant Police and Firefighters Ball. And it's going to be held at the embassy suites in the ballroom, the new hotel overlooking the harbor. And so there's still tickets available on TOMPSC.com. So please get well, your tickets. After, after this podcast, you send me a link to that. I'll, put it, I'll share it with our Facebook fans. Our family, oh, fantastic. Because I think that's a great thing to honor. Because one of the things that makes Mount Pleasant such a great place to live is the services we have, you Mm -hmm. know? And Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a good segue, if you don't mind, uh, Kathy, into talking about um, your issues. What's the most important thing for you? And and will it end up raising taxes? How are you going to circumvent raising taxes? Can you let our listeners know? 
try to sum it up fairly briefly, but uh, it's a big topic. And so I am first and foremost about solving problems. And I bring many, many years, 36 years, uh, just in my adulthood um, and my career of, uh, of being able to handle all different circumstances and come out with a much better result. And so uh, one of the biggest problems by far in our community, and it's no secret, is traffic congestion. And traffic congestion, initially, a lot of us that ran for council four years ago ran on the idea that residential growth was way ahead of itself. Um, too many places were converted from commercial or light industrial over to residential to try to deal with 2008 and 2009 and the aftermath of the recession. And so what happened is suddenly we had all this sprawl and not enough businesses and services nearby. So what does that do? It puts a ton of cars on the road. But it also creates another problem, and that is we were quickly running out of land. We all know we're surrounded on three sides by water and on the, on the other by a forest. So we're limited in our land. So one of the reasons I ran, which is very much about solving traffic congestion too, is because I felt we needed to diversify our industry here in Mount Pleasant. Currently, we're very dependent on healthcare and hospitality. And while they're both fabulous industries, it certainly is obvious after COVID and after 2008 how much hospitality can be hurt, especially in a recession. So I've been working as economic development chair. Uh, I sit on seven council, uh, council committees and I've sat on another one, so eight total, <clears throat> um, to bring more jobs and services to our side of the bridge. What that will do is ultimately, as we recruit more companies to come here and bring their jobs here and high paying jobs, is we'll be able to not only have less people have to cross the bridge to go somewhere else for work, right now it's about 28,000 a day, but we also hopefully will bring the average pay up even more so that more people can afford to live on this side of the bridge. Um, the other benefit is, is, is if we can diversify and we've looked at things like what the Charleston Regional Development Authority and the Charleston e County Economic Development Groups, what they have as the focus areas. And some of them don't fit us, like aerospace doesn't fit us, automotive doesn't fit us, but technology does. So actually it was my idea several years ago um, in trying to settle a lawsuit, which actually all worked out, but to ch change over a area that needed to be redeveloped on Long Point Road, right behind the Chick-fil-A, it was the old Van Smith concrete plant. And if you drive back there on Bell, Bell Point off of Long Point, uh, you'll see huge piles of concrete. It's not attractive, it's a dump. And that is going to be transformed into a technology and logistics campus and hopefully bring many high paying jobs and uh, keep folks from having to go over 526 over to North Charleston. They'll be able to stay on this side of the bridge. So, so you're going so to kind of build the tax basis and through the job creating jobs. Yes, sir. Absolutely. What's the thing that surprised you the most in running uh, right now? Uh, I, I'd say the thing that surprises me the most, I, I am someone who likes to offer solutions. And one of the solutions that I see is because of having been in the business world for many years, and especially a field like financial planning, where which is the career I built, um, where things have to be 100% above board and transparent, not so in government, as people know. I mean, this is not a surprise to any of us. And so I believe strongly that um, that we should try to be, I use this word proactive a lot, we should try to let people know before something becomes a problem, let people know when something is an idea rather than when it's a done deal. So a good example of that is recently um, I had heard, well, a while back, actually, I'd heard from a fellow that wanted to bring uh, an esports facility. And I didn't even know what esports were. I mean, I, I can put it together, but, and uh, so he explained it to Tom O'Rourke, um, and who head of finance and I'm economic development. And we met and talked about it and pretty soon met with the Charleston uh, Convention of Visitors, Visitors Bureau folks. And what we saw was this could be a means to an end, which is to have a esports facility that would be much more modest than people seem to think. But then the money that they would be able to bring would allow us to do the things that don't seem to be able to afford to come to Mount Pleasant, like ice skating or bowling alley, or even perhaps um, uh, different kinds of uh, cultural center things. And so to make a long story short, um, I thought, why don't we have him come to economic development and share that? And then what he can do, and then people can give their input. 
So my whole point was to be proactively transparent and let people have input. And instead of giving just input, suddenly people were saying, how could you possibly recruit this monstrosity to our community? <laughs> now, not everybody, because a lot of people were in favor and they understand what it is. But I do want your listeners and viewers to know that the way to solve problems and the way to have community input and have everybody feel like this is their hometown is to know about things early so that you can have that input and not to feel like you've been blindsided with something that's already happening. This is not already happening. This is in very early stages and could change dramatically. So I look forward in the next four years to be able to really listen to our folks and, and make sure that what they see is a much more proactive approach to bringing the things that will meet their needs and interests. And one of those, by the way, I wanna share with you is we did just finally get the, the final word so I can make it public now. And that is we are purchasing land at a deep discount to the appraised value. And it was actually a modest appraised value on Faison Road that we believe strongly will be able to allow us to bring things that are desperately needed on this side of town. Uh, I say this side, cause I live in Dunes West. Um, like a senior center, perhaps a Mount Pleasant Performing Arts Center. I'm even picturing the possibility of something like a mini Lincoln Center. That how many How many acres were purchased? Uh, um, almost 33, about 32.9. Really? And one of the things we couldn't say, people are like, why is this so secret? We couldn't say anything until we knew if the due diligence was clean. In other words, we needed to know, are there wetlands? Are there other things that would prohibit this? Because if that was true, then it just would have to fail. Instead, it was the opposite. It was actually very much uh, ready to go. And so what's so exciting is the town will have the ability now free of the cost of our land because, well, we're, we're paying for it, but I mean, but it's coming from the ARPA fund. So it's not even from our local taxpayers. And part of the American Relief Act was to try to help communities build back from what they lost in COVID. And we did lose a number of businesses. So this is something that will allow us to do some really special things, especially on the north end of town who have been in many cases ignored and a senior center right down the street from our senior living, such as uh, Merrill Gardens and Revel is gonna be incredible, but so also will a Mount Pleasant Performing Arts Center. So we're very excited about all of that possibility. Well, the senior center that's uh, in, in South Mount Pleasant certainly is a popular place. So yes. I think North Mount Pleasant definitely should have that ability so they don't have to drive from North Mount Pleasant to the senior center uh, here in South Mount Pleasant. Well, not only that, the Thomasina Stokes Marshall Center, which is incredible, it it's, is oversubscri incredible. It's, it's oversubscribed. I mean, not only is it a long drive from the other end of town, but, uh, you know, which again, contributes to traffic congestion. Why not have something where it's right down the street with a short shuttle or maybe even a walk um, for some of our seniors? And, um, and, and But on top of that, the, the Performing Arts Center, I can't say enough how many people really want to see a place where we can have concerts and ballet. And there's even an opera company, Halo, here in Mount Pleasant. Yes, so yeah. We have the South Carolina Symphony here. We have theater groups here and visual arts. Like I said, maybe a mini Lincoln Center. Um, Lincoln Center is 16 acres. This would probably be more like seven or eight acres of the of the 32.9. Even to have the, even to have that as part of the vision of it, the Lincoln Center in itself is a, is a, uh, is an outstanding thought. Yeah. Well, to have a, for instance, to have a visual arts where we could have a gallery slash museum that embraces our Gullah Geechee heritage and Sweetgrass Basket heritage, along with other types of art and artist studios and so forth. So the, the, the possibilities are endless. And by the way, in case people think this is all a pipe dream and the land doesn't bring you all this, the land is the first important step because normally to bring anything to Mount Pleasant, we have the highest impact fees in the entire state which is a enormous amount of money. When people, if people want to know 250,000 to bring a small restaurant. So before you even do anything else. Um, so a big center, like we're talking about would be very, very expensive. And then the land is some of the most expensive. Kathy, I've people. got, I've got, I've got two other things before we end it, but one of it is, and it's kind of a, a, a an intense question. Uh, be, I say intense, but a lot of people don't realize the difference between a strong mayor and a, and a week on, could you explain briefly what that is? And then I'd like to know what your feelings are about that. Okay. So I love a quote from my good friend, our mayor pro tem, Tom O'Rourke. Um, he says, you know, when you, if you want to ask me what I think about strong mayor, show me the mayor. And the problem is you don't know until after the fact, when you vote somebody in, whether this person is that kind of mayor. The reality is a strong council, which is what we have, means that we all have an equal vote. 
And the mayor does has a number of unique uh, roles, for instance, running the meetings and presiding over them, and also appointing all the committees, the committee chairs and the committees, but also the messenger and you know, I think an almost very good word would be like the cheerleader for the community, the person who gets out there and, and helps promote Mount Pleasant, both within and without the community, um, also sits on some very important boards. Um, so I think that type of mayor, which is what we have now, makes the most sense for Mount Pleasant. Because if you have a strong mayor, what you have is someone who is job day to day is hiring and firing staff. We have about 750 staff members. That's a big, big job all by itself, but also preparing the budget. So what if you hire a mayor who happens to be the more popular choice, but they have no background in budgeting and they have no background in hiring and firing and running a, a staff of 750 people. So having a, a professional who has over, in our case, over 20 years experience, um, and then on top of that, a master's degree in public administration, like we have with Eric DeMora, that makes a lot of sense, but his, but he does answer to us. It's our job as elected officials to listen to the community, to be uh, proactive, as I've said, and then to take that back. And that means sometimes asking Eric to, to do things in a different way. So I, you can tell I'm in favor of the strong council. And by the way, statistically across the country, as well as our state, strong council form of government tends to be much more cost efficient and it saves taxpayers a lot of money. Well, I think, too, I mean, it, j exactly what you said, it, it, having somebody as a town administrator that knows what they're doing and is is not what a mayor, typically a mayor has. Uh, mm -hmm. Joe Riley in, in, in Charleston was a totally different scene because what, like your friend said, it, show me the mayor, right? Um, uh, can I add one more thing? To oh, that? absolutely. Yeah, yeah for one sure. One quick add addition to that I meant to say. So uh, again, I mentioned earlier, I think of this as community service. What people may not realize is I already am probably the hardest worker on council and I don't think, and I'm not dis disrespecting anybody else. I just go, whatever needs to be done, whether it's I'm at every single ribbon cutting, including throughout my full four years, almost every single one, and many, many other proactive meetings in addition to all the required. Never missed a single meeting other than one that was called for a special thing when my brother passed away. It was a special assessment meeting and couldn't get it moved. Um, but I say this because uh, right now it's considered a part-time role of the mayor. I think with a community of 95,000, we need someone that can truly dedicate a lot of time to listening to our folks and to getting out there in the community as well as as all these other uh, responsibilities. And so I want the people of Mount Pleasant to know I am absolutely in the position and have the energy and ability to be full-time if that's what it takes. Someone, someone isn't going to have to tell me, hey, we need you to be full-time. If that's what it takes, I'll be doing it. I got you. Hey, before we go to the last question, because it's kind of personal, I'm anxious to talk to you about it. I just have to ask this, Kay. I'm sorry. Do you read Mount Pleasant Magazine? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so Although I have to I, say my reading has fallen off just a bit over the last several months. So I, you've been busy. I, I, you've been busy out there uh, politicking, right? Yes. A lot so, of <laughs> so so I know that your mom, your, your father and mom are special. Do you tell us a little bit about them? And then I'd like to know what they would say to you about running. I think that's a, a fair question to ask you. Who, who, what were they like and what did they do? So my dad uh, was actually born in 1914. I say that because people would be surprised. They'd think I wouldn't have a dad that was from that time frame, but um, definitely grew up in a Great Depression era, as did my mom, born in 24. And uh, he worked his way up from a factory job at International Paint. Um, this is a marine community. I've always lived in fishing communities. Lots of pictures of me holding fish as a child. And, um, uh, and he, uh, so the red propeller paint. Uh, everybody knows Interlux and um, that knows that area. And he worked his way all the way up to top management over 40 years, but he unfortunately passed away when he was only 61 and I was uh, uh, 12 years old. And then my mom was a school teacher, but she had a very uh, tough time too. She actually lost her mom in childbirth. So she ended up going into the um, army as a WAC in World War II and then went to college wow. and, and her master's degree on the GI Bill became a school teacher, taught for 24 years, um, and they both lost their first spouses um, who passed away, and then they met each other and married and had me. So um, I, I think today they were wonderful role models for me. They taught me a tremendous amount. They both, especially my mom, talked constantly about the importance of education and how that really helps you rise out of whatever circumstances you're in. So I'm a huge believer 
in that. So if they were with us today, what would they say about you running? They would, I, I believe they'd be very proud of the fact that I'm willing to put this much energy and time and, and caring and love into my community. And on top of that, I think they'd be very uh, proud of the fact that I'm standing up for what I believe in, which is, which is really solving problems and, and helping everyone be empowered to, to live the best life they can. Well, I, I, I wanted to ask that question because I want to do a shout out to your mom and dad, because it's probably been a while since you've done that. That was fun, wasn't it? Yes, absolutely. I know they would really appreciate it. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. So thanks for being here. I hope we've enlightened people of who you are, what you're about. And uh, that's what Mount Pleasant Magazine is about is like writing and talking and interviewing like we're doing here. The people that make Mount Pleasant a, such a special place to live. So um, I just wanted to say uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, I'm sorry. Thanks for joining us. And uh, I look forward to seeing the results of this. Thank you so much, Bill. I appreciate everyone's time today. Okay, thanks. Thank and thanks, everybody, for joining us here on my Pleasant Magazine podcast. And uh, I appreciate again, Kathy, you being here. Thanks for spending your time with the Mount Pleasant Magazine podcast, your community, your podcast. Listen to past and future episodes at mountpleasantpodcast.com.